What happens after someone's child disappears? Usually the family gets the police involved immediately, and if they find a body, an autopsy follows. This wasn't the case with little Paulette Gabara Vara. Her body was discovered 10 days after her family announced her disappearance. And what followed were so many conflicting statements that to this day, 11 years later, the truth behind what happened to her is still a mystery. Be warned, the story is really sad and infuriating. Paulette's parents are one of the most scrutinized families in Mexico. And whatever happened between the police and the other parties involved is definitely shady. That being said, let's dive in. On July 20th, 2005, Paulette was born as the youngest daughter to her parents, Lizette Farah and Mauricio Gabara in Mexico City. Her sister, who is three years older than Paulette, is also called Lizette, just like her mom. We will be referring to her as Lizette Jr. to make things a bit easier. Paulette lived with a developmental disability that impacted both her speech and movement. The family actually thought they were going to lose her when she was born. It was therefore very complicated for her to communicate verbally with her family and friends. She would only speak separate words like mom, dad, or food, but she couldn't form any sentences. And she couldn't walk without help, even though she was already kindergarten age. This will become an important detail later. On Sunday, March 21st, 2010, the two girls arrived home from a weekend trip to Valle de Bravo with their dad. The same weekend, their mom went on a separate trip to Los Cabos with her friend Amanda. When the girls got back home at around 9 p.m., Lizette was already there, so she put her daughters to bed. According to her, there was nothing unusual that night. Lizette worked as an attorney, and Mauricio worked in real estate, so they were busy pretty much all the time. They made good money though, so they hired two nannies, who were also sisters, to make sure the girls were always taken care of during the day. The next morning after the trip, the nannies got to the apartment to get the girls ready for school, but one of the nannies, Erica, went to Paulette's room only to find the room was empty. Both nannies searched every corner of the bedroom, but they couldn't find Paulette anywhere. Erica and her sister Martha went on to search for Paulette all around the apartment, including outside, in the hallway, the elevator, and the floors beneath, but she was nowhere to be found. The nannies realized the situation was serious, and they informed the parents immediately. Paulette's family lived in a tall building, at one of its highest levels, so the probability of Paulette leaving the building on her own was highly unlikely, especially because of her motor disability. The girl's disappearance was extremely strange. The parents informed the police and a forensics team came to the apartment straight away. Apparently, the apartment was searched five times just on the first day. The case gained immediate attention on TV and media throughout Mexico, making the national news every single day. Paulette's parents also made flyers and huge billboard posters, which they hung all over Mexico City, hoping that someone would have seen their daughter. Paulette's mother, Lizette, gave countless interviews during those days, describing her daughter as an angel who never cried, and hoping that if someone had taken her, they would return her to safety. First of all, Paulette couldn't have left the apartment on her own. Second of all, there were no signs of a break-in, which could mean an intruder had been in the house or they had access to a key. However, it's strange that when investigators came to the apartment, they were only allowed to search for signs of breaking and entering, and nothing more. Orders had come from above that limited what the police could do in this case. Apparently, the family also had two dogs at the time, and the dogs didn't bark once that night. So if there wasn't a break-in, and the dogs didn't notice anything either, it seems right now like the only possible suspect should be someone in the family or their proximity, right? Well, it's about to get much weirder. As soon as Paulette was declared missing, the Attorney General of the state, Alberto Bazbaz, became seriously involved in the case. This became a controversy in itself, as out of the hundreds of children going missing in Mexico each year, Bazbaz somehow chose Paulette as a focus case. The general opinion was that he was only interested in the case of Paulette because her family was rich. The next day, Bazbaz released a billboard poster with a photo of Paulette and information about her age, appearance, and physical disabilities. Paulette's aunt, Arlette, sent emails to social networks asking for help in finding Paulette. The news spread very quickly, and the internet made a very big deal out of Paulette's story. That same evening, Lizette, Paulette's mom, released a message on TV. 
She was asking her daughter's alleged abductor to return the girl safely. Indeed, the public thought this was a likely scenario since the family was quite rich. Maybe someone had taken Paulette and was about to demand ransom. Lizette said something by the likes of, You can leave my daughter in a shopping center or a crowded space and there would be no consequences. But this is only one of the many confusing messages that Paulette's parents sent throughout the following days. In fact, they kept correcting and changing their stories so much that one week after Paulette went missing, both parents and the two nannies were taken into custody. Alberto Bazbaz explained why. Each one of them at a certain moment have falsified their statements, which has made it difficult to know the truth of the facts and clarify a firm line of investigation. And this is where it gets really strange. Usually when more information comes to light or when a body is discovered, there's a breakthrough in the case and the investigation can move forward. In the case of Paulette Jabera Fara, the breakthrough only meant more questions and more frustration. On March 31st, in the dead of night, 2 a.m. to be precise, three forensic experts filmed a recreation of the search of Paulette's room after her disappearance. There are two very weird things here already. One, no one had searched the room at 2 a.m. before. Obviously, investigators had been in the room many times, but only during working hours. Two, apparently no one asked the investigators to film a recreation of the search. To this day, no one knows why these people were filming in Paulette's room in the middle of the night. During this creepy video, the investigators point to the sheets with big blood stains on them, one of them the size of an adult's head. One of the men declares that it's obvious that Paulette was beaten very badly. This statement was immediately refuted by Alberto Bazbaz, but the video was leaked to the public and the truth was already out. During this filming, the investigators were measuring the bed and pulling the blankets at the end of the mattress when they discovered Paulette's body. Unexplainably, the girl was lodged between the end of the mattress and the foot of the bed. She was wearing the same pajamas she wore the night before she had disappeared. Wait a minute. So no one found Paulette there in nine days? Hundreds of people had been in her room since her disappearance. In fact, both nannies testified to having looked all around the mattress. Martha Casimiro said, I looked in the bedroom, under the bed, and in the closet. Then I went back to look for her in the bedroom. Her sister Erica added that it was practically impossible for Paulette to have been lodged in the bed like that from the start. I think we would have noticed, since thousands of people came to look for her, the bed was made. I never saw the mattress pulled back. I did not see a bundle or anything. It does not make sense to me that the body could have been there since Monday. Paulette's parents first admitted that the nannies had searched the room and called them about the disappearance. Later on in the investigation, they changed their story and said it wasn't even the nannies who realized the girl was missing, but Mauricio's sister. Then they also claimed that the nannies never called them about their daughter's disappearance. The nannies, on the other hand, described the phone call that they had had with the parents the morning Paulette vanished, and they described Lizette and Mauricio acting calm and unsurprised like it was just another day. After the video was released, Alberto Bazbaz quickly decided that Paulette had suffocated on her own after she fell behind the mattress in her sleep. In his own words, she died accidentally due to mechanical asphagia due to the obstruction of nasal cavities. Apparently, Paulette always slept with an orthopedic cloth over her mouth, which prevented her from opening her mouth in her sleep, which was a problem due to her disability. It seemed like the police had come to a conclusion and that the case could finally be closed. But even though in the video there is a clear statement regarding physical harm inflicted on the girl, the police completely erased this part and only kept the part where Paulette had allegedly wedged herself between the mattress and the bed, painting the picture of an accident. And there are several problems with the forensics video too, apart from those already stated. Most experts who have analyzed it agree that it's a reenactment, not a real-time event of finding Paulette's body. First of all, the camera was placed in a perfect place for the viewers to see all investigators as well as the corner of the bed where her body would be found. Second of all, the investigator spoke with quite a lot of detail about how Paulette was beaten before actually finding her body. Lastly, and perhaps most disturbing fact yet, the three men who found the body didn't seem surprised at all. After they discover the body, they continue narrating the events from the day the room initially was searched in a calm and monotonous way. People have noted that this video looks much more like a badly rehearsed script than a legal forensics video. There's more. During the nine days that people were searching for Paulette, Lizette's friend Amanda De La Rosa came to stay at their place. 
Not only did she stay there, but she slept in Paulette's bed. Why was the room not secured by the authorities? And how come, even though the bed was made every day, no one discovered or even smelled the body? Remember, we're talking about nine days. Also during these nine days, several news reporters came into the house and interviewed Lizette while she sat on Paulette's bed. The bed has been changed, people had slept on the bed, and you know, people had searched the whole place so extensively, but nobody found her in the bed. When the police found out that Amanda had been at the house, they brought her into the police station and questioned her as a suspect. But she was quickly released with no charges filed. After the investigation, Amanda wrote a book titled, Where's Paulette? In the book, she narrates the events from her perspective and questions the discrepancies between the facts and the authorities' conflicting statements. So if Amanda didn't do it, nor was there any stranger in the house, and the nannies insisted they searched the bed on March 22nd, and there was no body, who could have been the culprit? By process of elimination, the only people left are Paulette's parents and her sister, Lizette Jr. The problem was that, by now, lots of people had been in the house, and it wasn't considered a crime scene. The room was so heavily contaminated with footprints and DNA that it was impossible to use forensics experts to trace things back to the night of the disappearance. According to Erica, the parents were awfully calm and composed, while everyone else was frantically searching for their daughter. Erica said that the morning after Paulette went missing, her mother was sitting relaxed in the living room, calmly drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. She never showed any signs of anxiety or grieving to anyone during these days. It seems like she already knew the truth and were planning a discovery that wouldn't alarm their family or harm their image. While nothing in these terms was ever proven, many facts point in this direction. Days after Paulette's disappearance and Lizette's public video where she addressed an alleged abductor, no one had called. When the media confronted Lizette with this lack of contact, she joked that maybe her daughter had been abducted by aliens or, quote, even Harry Potter. Then she made the worst statement yet. Even if I lose Paulette, I still have another daughter. Then there was the autopsy. It was the coroner that first said that Paulette had slept with an orthopedic cloth over her mouth. She had two sticky pieces of cloth on her cheeks and they also stated that the body was not moved after she died. However, there were signs of an injury on her left elbow and knee. The initial report released on March 31st when the body was found indicates the probable date of her passing as March 28th, one week after Paulette was declared missing. In fact, forensic experts agreed with the probable date, saying that most likely this was the case of a homicide. They also said it would have been impossible to hide a body or just not find it for nine days, as the smell would have been impossible to ignore. Then overnight, the probable date was changed to March 21st. The forensics expert in charge of the investigation admitted that an unidentified high command of the state asked him to correct the date, establishing a non-specific time between March 21st and 26th as the official date. Why these dates and why the change? And once again, the cause of her passing, an accident caused by medical asphagia, does not explain the stains shown in the forensics video. How could the coroner just lie about these facts? Who told him to do it? It is unknown just how rich or connected Paulette's parents were at the time of the event. Could they have had so much power that they imposed a big cover-up to the police of Mexico City? Cover-up is a big word, but not when you listen to a recording between Lizette and her other daughter, Lizette Jr. The recording was released during the investigation. Here, the mom tells the daughter not to say anything of Paulette's disappearance to anyone so that they would not be blamed. Why, mom? Because otherwise, they will blame us for stealing her or that you took her away to be stolen. Lizette initially denied ever saying this and claimed someone edited the recording so that it sounded like she was saying these words. She told the police. A few days later, though, she accepted that she did say this. This time, she stated that she did have the conversation with her daughter, but not in the context they showed. And even weirder, it was Antonio Bazbaz that revealed this recording to the public in a press conference. This was the same man who ruled the incident as an accident and who decided to erase the part of the video that spoke about Paulette being beaten. During the press conference, Bazbaz spoke about Lizette's personality as something that caught the authorities' attention. There's a lot of attention on her ability to speak. The police went on to create a psychological profile for the mom and concluded that she had some serious personality disorders. 
However, the police emphasize that the mother's personality disorders are not a criminal act in itself, and do not justify arresting Lizette. Even so, Bazbaz noted that Lizette appeared very cold and her inconsistent statements do make her a suspect in the case. Sandra Yadium, a legal psychiatric expert, agreed with Bazbaz's statement about Lizette being unusually cold. She has always remained very distant in matters of affection and emotional attachment. But this was 11 years ago. After Paulette's passing was ruled as an accident, no one opened the case again. No one said, well, the facts just don't add up. Paulette's parents were quickly released from custody and the police seemed happy with the conclusion of the case. Except people weren't. It was pretty clear that the police were giving conflicting statements too. On the one hand, Bazbaz was trying to get to the bottom of the story and looking at the mother as a possible subject. On the other hand, the case was closed following an implausible video and a corrected coroner statement. People started looking at other signs of strange behavior from Paulette's family. The events had a visible effect on Lizette and Mauricio's marriage, and the couple soon broke up in the aftermath of the crisis, eventually completing the divorce in 2014. In the years following Paulette's case, new information came to light. The weekend the daughters were away with their dad right before Paulette went missing, Lizette was not on a weekend getaway with her friend Amanda. She was having an affair. Right after Paulette's body was discovered, Lizette filed a restraining order against the rest of her family and took Mauricio to court over the custody of Lizette Jr. Both of them appeared several times on TV and were asked about the restraining order. Both of them accused the other of knowing something about what happened to their daughter, but neither gave any revealing details. Paulette was buried on April 6th, and Mauricio did not attend the service. Lizette told the press that she couldn't believe her husband thought she had something to do with this tragedy. Apparently, Mauricio asked Lizette not to attend the service herself and did not show up, only because she did. The following month, Alberto Bazbaz resigned as attorney general. He insisted that the case was conducted properly, denying mishandling by any other people except himself. Bazbaz blamed himself for taking so long to find a body that was hidden in plain sight. Resigning was perhaps the last act of the play meant to cover the very strange circumstances surrounding Paulette's case. If all blame fell on Bazbaz, then no one would keep searching for police mishandling. But the case was still severely criticized in the media. Mexican politician Jesus Ortega called out the governor of Mexico State and demanded that he take responsibility for the disaster of an investigation. Around 100 policemen went through this room of 10 meters. Sniffer dogs searched it and they never found the body. Who do they want to protect? In 2017, Paulette's body was exhumed and cremated. Why? The family didn't say. But one guess would be so that the case could never be reopened. If the police ever decided to do so, they won't have a body to conduct an autopsy on. Today, 11 years later, the family is completely separated and fairly quiet. Mauricio keeps to himself and is 100% private on social media. Lizette is living with her daughter Lizette Jr. and occasionally gives interviews. In her most recent interview, Lizette told the press she doesn't hold any grudge against the people who thought she was involved. However, she says, she does resent the fact that all this speculation ended up on trusted news resources as well. Apart from heavy speculation, there is still zero truth about who Paulette's killer really is. It's not known just how much the family was involved in the incident, and all justice seekers have are fragments of statements and recordings that prove some foul business definitely took place. Theories range from Lizette ending her daughter's life because she had a disability, to Paulette already being dead when Mauricio returned with the daughters from the trip. People have suggested that perhaps Alberto Vazbaz covered for Mauricio by shifting blame towards Lizette. However, Lizette's cold behavior was noticed by many people, including a legal psychiatrist. It's hard to say if the prosecutor was controlled by one parent or the other. One other theory is that the parents staged their daughter's disappearance so that they could get some money. Apparently, the family was struggling financially around that time, and they were worried they couldn't afford to keep paying the mortgage for their very expensive apartment in the center of Mexico City. The theory goes that by staging the disappearance of Paulette, they could extort money from her grandparents or the government. That would explain all the interviews where Lizette and Mauricio are begging an alleged culprit to return their daughter, when we know by now that's not what happened to Paulette. But the ransom theory doesn't sound very likely, considering why the supporters of this theory think Paulette died. 
According to them, the parents hid her in an air duct and told her to wait there for a few days until they got the ransom. Then, because of the disability, somehow she suffocated in the air duct. Finally, they decided to put her between the mattress and the bed, and we all know how it went from there. This seems like a far-fetched story with a lot of details that there is zero evidence about. Another theory states that Lizette Jr. accidentally suffocated her sister, then her parents went to extreme lengths to cover up the deed. However, judging by the video where the investigator describes the body as severely beaten, it's pretty unlikely that a primary school girl could have done something like this. Of course, a case where so little justice is served pushes people to be desperate about finding the truth. Regardless of the theory, most people believe the parents were in cahoots in trying to cover up the tragedy. And most people consider the investigation rigged from the get-go, considering the apartment was searched five times on just the first day and no one found her. But as sad and frustrating as it is, we may never get to the bottom of the story behind Paulette Jabara Farah. This brings us to the end of the video. What do you think about the handling of Paulette's case? Do you think the police were right in determining what ended her life? If not, who do you think was the culprit? Write us a thoughtful comment and don't forget to click the thumbs up if you liked our video. And of course, if you want more chilling stories in your life, make sure to subscribe to the channel. See you next time.